Welcome! My latest project is this. It is a 16K Color Computer 2 by Tandy Radio Shack. This is the 16K Extended Color Basic version. And this one I just got off eBay. It claimed to be new. And it does actually look new. It's nice, fresh looking, not yellowed. Um, anyway, you'll see me open this thing up, uh, try it out, install a composite mod in it, upgrade the RAM from 16K to 64K, socket the video chip in preparation for a Coco VGA, and I will also build a multi-pack interface. I built this based on some PC board artwork that I found online on GitHub. I was anxious to try it out. I always wanted a multi-pack interface, but I never had the money to buy one back in the day. So I'm going to build one now and see if we can make it work. Okay, a new package has arrived. Let's see what it is. I always enjoy getting new things. This is something I bought off of eBay, something I've wanted to get for a while. And it is a TRS-80 Color Computer 2. Oh, there we go. You find these on eBay a lot. Uh, this one claimed to be new, so we will see if it actually looks new. Can't be new new, but it could be new old stock new. So this certainly looks unused, introducing your color computer to. Look in here. Down there is the TV switch. And it's certainly been opened, but it could be new. There is an RCA cable. In here, it's a color computer too. Get out of this bag. Oh, that fuzzy stuff there it is. There is the back of it. Okay, let's see what it takes to open it up. I was tempted to power it up first, but you know, maybe it does make sense to actually open it up first. There, we've got that piece off. Now we can see inside of it. Let's flip him around and look at the back. Let's see what it takes to take the keyboard off. Looks like there's a flex cable here. Looks like it's just going to push in. Keyboard removed. Okay, so it is time to power up the color computer for its very first time. So I've hooked it up to my monitor. I do actually have a monitor that has an RF input. They're kind of hard to find these days. Well, let's find the monitor and turn it to channel 3. Source. TV. It's on channel 3. So this Coco has conceivably never been powered on. Let's find out what happens. It's plugged in. Maybe it's on channel 4.
There we go. Extended color basic. Okay, it's not the best looking screen in the world. Uh, maybe that's just a artifact of the monitor I'm using. Ten. So I think this actually does not have a lower case. There we go, working as expected. There's a break button, so that worked. I would like to get the video quality to look better. I'll have to look into what is going on with that. Certainly this is, you know, it's an RF computer meant to hook to an RF CRT monitor. But still, we've got some weird stuff, like we've got this artifacting down the side. We've got some ghosting. I want. Let's try the sound and see if that is working. So we'll do a play, ABC. It's been a while since I did my basics, so hopefully that's right. Okay, seems like that worked. So I would say this thing is pretty much working. Um, let's see if we can modify it. Okay, it's time to do some upgrades. So the first thing I'm going to do is to increase the amount of RAM. Now there are eight RAM chips over here. I believe these chips are 2K each, which gives you your 16K of memory. They are socketed, so it would be fairly easy to pull them out. And then, according to the instructions, I should replace them with 4164 chips, so I will do that. You also have to install a jumper over here at the 64K spot, so I will install something there. And then while I have it apart, I'm also going to pull this video chip here out, desolder it. This is the, um, what is this thing? This is the 6847. My goal is to install in this something called a, um, a Coco VGA which is a VGA output, but you need to be able to pull your 6847 and install the, the Coco VGA board in its place. So this one is not socketed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it out and install a socket. It's a large 40 pin chip, but I ought to be able to do it safely with my HACO. Um, now there is a shield on bottom, I think, because I can see some little spots up here where maybe the shield is attached. So I'm, Take it, I'm going to unhook it all and then flip it over and then we'll see if we can pull the shield off. Makes me feel a little bit funny working on a brand new color computer. Okay, so here is the board after pulling out the uh, video controller and putting in a socket. So this was a little bit of a delicate operation even with a good quality HACO desoldering gun. I still actually pulled loose the pads on the top two pins from the underside. Now those ones aren't actually hooked to anything, which is nice. Um, so it doesn't hurt that those pads got pulled off. Nevertheless, you hate seeing a pad come off of a vintage board like this. You just have to be really careful. And then you have to be really careful that you get it soldered all the way through up to the top because that's where it's actually making its electrical connection is on the top. So hopefully I've done a good job and I can reinstall my video chip and try this thing out and make sure it still works. The next task is going to be to replace these 8 DRAM chips with 4164s to bring this up to 64K. So I have a couple sticks of DRAM here, 4164s. I'm going to pull these out and replace them with 8 of those. Okay, I think we've got them all. They're all pointed the right direction. No pins are bent. And none are misaligned. I think we can, can do a test now. Then the other thing to do, you have to install a jumper over here. When I had the board out, I soldered across this little switch. Uh, that will allow me to change the RAM back if I ever want to without having to pull the board. 
So I'll just push the switch over into the on position. Okay, let's try turning it on. A little ghosting came back on the side. I've noticed as I played with this, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. I don't think it has to do anything with what channel is selected. Not sure what causes it, but anyway, let's check our print mem. And now we have 24K. Now the reason we only went from 8 to 24, rather than going up to much higher like 64, is because this thing does actually do bank switching on between the ROM and the RAM. So the top 32K of the address space is currently occupied by the, the basic ROM, the cartridge slot, stuff like this. Um, if you're running an operating system that was capable of using 64K, like OS 9, then it could switch in and out that top 64K of RAM. But for now, um, we only have access to the lower 32K, but this dish does show that our uh, memory upgrade was successful. Okay, probably just a couple of minutes ago, I talked about how I was gonna socket this chip here in preparation for a Coco VGA board. Well, since then, a few days have gone by, I learned that the lead time for Coco VGA boards is really long, on the order of months. And, uh, impatient person that I am, I'm not gonna wait for that. I'm gonna come up with a different solution to the crappy video output and that is going to be to install this composite mod. Now Ed Snyder makes these and I think they're based on a design that is actually period accurate. Uh, that the original Cocos, there was an educational version and the educational version um, hooked up to a composite monitor rather than to a TV and it used a little board like this in place of the RF modulator and it had a little jack here that had video and sound output. So what we have to do, we have to pull this back apart um, then we'll have to desolder the RF modulator. Then in its place, we will install the uh, composite board. Got to hook a couple of wires up here to some diodes. Um, Ed Snyder's website tells all how to do this, so pull this apart. I'm going to get out the, uh, the trusty Hacko again and desolder that and put the new one in. Okay, here is the board with the RF modulator removed. Here's the RF modulator. It was a bit of work to get out. The pins themselves weren't hard, but these little tabs, there's four little tabs that go all the way around it. Uh, they poke through those slotted holes uh, that you can see down there in the board. And those tabs, uh, the hacko really won't take them out, so you got to go after them with desoldering braid. There's a lot of solder on it. Um, and then you probably got to take your needle nose, you got to work it back and forth, make sure it's free, because you just don't want to rip a pad loose or something, so you got to work all four of those, then eventually it'll pop off of there, and you've got a nice clean place uh, to put your new board, which is going to go in there. Can't quite see it. Then you've got a nice place to put your new board, which is going to go, it's going to fit in kind of like that. Um, we'll want to want to kind of tack it in, make sure it's soldered in uh, straight and everything, and it's, it's got its own little tab up here to deal with on the end. We'll get that sorted out, we'll get this board mounted, and then we'll be most of the way there. We'll just have to hook up these two um, wires here to uh, a couple of the uh, diodes that are in there. And the final step is to solder the white and the red wires. I trimmed them a little bit short. The white one hooks to the top side of this diode and the red one comes down here and hooks to the bottom side of that diode. Ed actually gives some instructions. You can verify the voltages. The white should have around 8.4 volts AC. Mine had about 8. And the red, he says, should be about 9.9 .9 volts DC. Mine was closer to 9. So hopefully, hopefully it's close enough. Um, I'm not sure why the divergence, but um, I think we're ready to try this thing out now. Um, we we'll just need to plug a uh, plug into there and we should be able to hook it up to our monitor and have composite output. Okay, let's go ahead and power it on with the new composite adapter and see how it looks. There it goes, extended color basic 1.1. It's still not perfect. I can see a little bit of banding, but certainly that large ghosting effect is gone, you know, and that's great. Um, it also has a switch here the switch that used to be the channel 3-4 switch is now a color versus black and white switch. So if we flip it over, we get this black and white picture, and that black and white picture is perfectly crystal clear. I mean, that is awesome. Uh, but it is a color computer, so of course. We'll use it in color mode, which uh, this is probably some of the best you're going to get short of an actual CRT monitor 
or an actual uh, Coco VGA board that would give you digital video instead of uh, composite. But I am really, really happy with the quality of this uh, color video output. Now another thing you can do is you can make your own cartridges. So I found both this case and this uh, cartridge PC board online. I sent them off to JLC PCB and had the uh, PC board made and all it takes is uh, an EEPROM or in this case I used an electronic erasable EEPROM 28C64 and 8K um, together with a, a bypass capacitor and a couple jumpers and you have yourself a color computer cartridge. This one here I programmed into it the game Space Assault. So you just take it and you put it in the cartridge shell. I 3D printed the cartridge shell on my Prusa i3 Mark III. I even inset Space Assault so we would know what the cartridge is. Then you need a single screw to go in the back. And there we have it. Now I have a cartridge. Also made myself a diagnostics cartridge. This one I printed in marble PETG. Same circuit board, uh, same uh, EEPROM, just a different uh, image that I burned to it. This one for a diagnostics program. Now back when I owned my color computer, it had a floppy drive. I think it was an FD501 that I had. It was a single, large, full height, five and a quarter inch drive. It had a controller that plugged into the Coco and a cable that went between them. Now, I don't have one of those now. I would still like to get one, but in the meantime, I did grab a Coco SDC. I think I got this from Ed Snyder's website as well. And uh, what it is, it's an emulator for the floppy drive and it has an SD card, so you can put many images on the SD card. Um, it also emulates ROMs, so you can pretend like you have some ROMs and switch between them. It's really a very versatile little board, and it's pretty inexpensive. You spend less for this than you would to buy an FD501 floppy drive. Now, of course, it lacks the nostalgia of the real floppy drive, but it also lacks all of the problems of the real floppy drive. For example, you really don't have to worry about your disk going bad or your drive going out of alignment or you don't have to source old floppy disks. Saves you a lot of grief. Like I said, I still want to get myself uh, a real floppy drive, but for now, I think I'll be playing with this Coco SDC instead. Okay, next up, I'm going to build a multi-pack interface. Now, a multi-pack interface was something I always wanted. It is a device that lets you hook four cartridges up to your color computer. Now, you might think, what's the point of hooking up four ROM cartridges? You could just unplug one cartridge and plug another in. Is it really that much work to just pull out a cartridge and plug a different one in? But where this really came to be useful was when you were using the disk controller, because the disk controller would occupy a cartridge slot. If you wanted to plug in something else, like your speech sound pack or your orchestra 90 or something you would have to not be able to use the disc controller so the multi-pack interface lets you plug in the disc and some of your other peripherals you can still find multi-pack interfaces on ebay usually there's one or two or sometimes three of them at a time uh, sometimes they sell for as much as like 150 dollars they're not cheap so i looked online and it thought, well, someone must have reverse engineered this. So first of all, on uh, Ed Snyder's website, there is um, something he calls the Mega MPI, as well as the Mini MPI, which is a modern replacement. I thought about getting that one, but it would have been funner just to build something. So I searched around a little bit longer, and I found this project on eBay. It is by the Little Engineers um, and or Gimechip.org. Um, it's actually got a dedication, or someone dedicated it, um, in memory of Robert Embry Turner. Um, this must be by his son. Rest in peace. Very touching um, dedication there. But I found this online. Um, the GitHub repo said they weren't even sure that it worked. Uh, but I just I downloaded the artwork, sent it off to JLPCB, and it showed up in the mail. And I soldered it together, and you're going to see me try this thing out and uh, we'll see if I can get myself a multi-pack on the cheap. And by on the cheap, I mean that it probably still cost me about 50 bucks to build this thing. Um, anyway, let's get started. Okay, I finished uh, soldering up the board. The one thing I did not do is I did not put in the ATX connector here. I put in a single small 5 volt jack, so I will just power this board off of 5 volt and I won't uh, supply the 12 volt plus and minus to the connectors. 
I think that's fine. I don't have any connectors that require uh, 12 volt at this time, so I'm not going to worry about that. It's simpler uh, just to use the 5 volt supply, and I can plug it into a USB charger. Um, so I did not also did not populate the um, the LED that goes with the ATX supply. But there is an LED for the 5 volt from the jack as well as the 5 volt from the uh, color computer. Socketed all of the chips. I installed uh, four sockets here for the cartridges. So the build itself went fine. It was just uh, straightforward uh, soldering uh, dip sockets and connectors and such. Uh, there, if you do decide to build one of these yourself, there are a few things to be aware of with the artwork that I found online. So one thing is these connectors are not evenly spaced. It's a little bit weird. Um, these two are closer, um, and these two are a little bit closer. These two are further away. It'd be nice if the connectors were laid out equally spaced. Uh, the other thing that is weird about the connectors is the standard multi-pack numbers them 1, 2, 3, 4 whereas this PC board went for three, two, one. Now you might think, does it really matter which order they're in? And from an electrical standpoint, not. But typically you place your disc controller in the number four slot. On a typical multi-pack, that'd be all the way here in the back. On this multi-pack, it's all the way here in the front. So the disc controller is gonna kind of obscure the other slots behind it because it's kind of tall. Um, other little interesting things about this board, this one chip is really close to the edge. Uh, that made it a little bit of a challenge to design a 3D printed case for it. If it was me, I'd probably move the chip up a little bit. And the, the length of this neck coming out here was just was a little bit tight. I was able to put a 2mm case around it, but it just barely plugs into the Coco. Uh, setting this back another two millimeters would, would give it some breathing room. So one thing, uh, I did have uh, JLC PCB when I sent them the board. They did flag uh, two spots they didn't like. One of them was this uh, TLE logo here, which is in the top copper. And then there's another one here. Uh, these were actually cross-hatched. Uh, let me see if the cross-hatch pattern... Um, cross-hatched just like this one here. Um, and they wanted to convert it to a, to a solid pour. Um, I don't know why they decided to do that, uh, but I told them go ahead, convert it to a solid pour, doesn't matter. Another sort of interesting thing about this board is um, this trace here uh, goes right through this uh, URL. It comes down, goes right through the middle of the font. It doesn't hurt anything, doesn't short it out, uh, but just be aware there's a trace there. And then there's also a trace that goes uh, through this TLE character, just goes right through it again. Doesn't seem to hurt anything, doesn't short it out, it just uh, goes through and does conduct to the logo. If I was to make a respin of this board, I would probably take um, any of these uh, logo and writing artifacts that are in a copper layer and probably just move them to, um, to a silk screen layer, just because it makes things a little bit more difficult for the board house when there's um, traces going through stuff and when there's cross hatch patterns they tend to question that a little bit. A straightforward build and again it's you know it's it's really um, nice that, um, that that I was able to find this board and that the uh, the author of this board put it up there and put the artwork up uh, and I was able to send it off to GLC PCB and get my bare board and um, and make this thing. So I did design a 3D printed case to go around it um, this is going to sit in the case, kind of like so, and let's go ahead and put it together and uh, try it out. I designed a couple different lids as part of the 3D printed case. The first one was this shallow lid. This was my uh, first prototype. And uh, they're all a little bit hard to snap into place, but... Um, Kind of see how it goes and you put four screws in to hold it together. But I didn't like this shallow lid because it really doesn't give much support around the cartridges. Uh, so I went and I made a different one. This one here is my taller lid. It's about uh, 30 millimeters tall. Gives a bit more support. It's also a little bit of a challenge to snap into place together like that. Still takes four screws, a little bit longer. And now the cartridges, they fit in there with some protection around them. So I kind of like this one. I think this one is going to be good to go.
Now one thing about this one is it does, um, it does bury the dip switch that you use to select the initial cartridge really deep. So I've come up with a plan where I could put this rotary switch. I put a little uh, footprint there for the rotary switch. We could mount that inside and have a rotary switch to pick the, uh, the initial cartridge. So I may go ahead and do that. Okay, so it's time to try this out. I have plugged it into the color computer. Let me put in slot number four, the Coco SDC. Then behind it, I'm gonna put a diagnostics cartridge. And then behind that, we'll put my a space assault cartridge. I don't actually have a, another cartridge to put back there in slot one yet. Um, but this will at least let us test the first three slots. I pointed the rotary control where I believe it will be selecting slot number four. Okay, let's turn it on and see what happens. Okay, as expected, I have selected slot number four. That is the Coco SDC. Let's switch to slot number three and reboot. And we have the diagnostics cartridge. Switch to slot number two. We have Space Assault. Switch to slot number one. Slot number one, we've just got plain, ordinary, extended color basic, so no cartridge selected at all. So I would say the basics here are working. Of course, one of the nice things about uh, the multi-pack is that you can do it through computer control. So if we poke 65407 and we send a 17, that ought to select slot 2, which will be Space Assault. There, Space Assault. If I reset, it should go back to slot number 1. Okay, and then if we poke 65407... 34. These are right out of the multi-pack manual, by the way, is where I'm getting these numbers. This should select slot 3, which should be the diagnostic cartridge. And it is diagnostics. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sand rail stuff. Bye.